Hey everyone, Brady from Texture Labs here, working in Photoshop today, and we're getting into some retro rock and roll 80s screen print looks. We're gonna try to capture a little bit of the spirit of a certain golden age of screen printing, where there was a lot of innovation, a lot of experimentation, both with the artwork, but also with the technical process of screen printing it. Screen printing, of course, a physical process with certain technical constraints. So we're gonna get into Photoshop, and we're gonna work under some very specific, kind of similar constraints. We're gonna use a very limited palette of colors, no anti-aliasing, no blending of colors, and we'll see if we can capture a little bit of that rock and roll spirit. Let's get into Photoshop and get started. All right, I'm here in Photoshop and I'm starting off with a fairly large canvas size. It's 3905 by 3550, which basically translates to 11 by 10 inches at 355 pixels per inch, a pretty reasonable size for a t-shirt screen print. But I'm starting off with a little bit of a challenge. I've got an image here that was really tiny and I clipped it out and scaled it way up. So it's a little bit blurry, a little bit grainy, but we'll see if we can make it work. I'm gonna right click and convert this layer to a smart object so we can apply some filters and things and keep all those settings live. All right, let's get started with part one. And here we're gonna limit the image to just four values, black, then dark gray, light gray, and white. So I'm gonna start by removing all the color from this image. I'll just use hue saturation, bring the saturation all the way down. Then I'm gonna create a solid fill layer. I'm gonna set this to be somewhere in the oranges with kind of a middle of the road brightness and saturation to get started. All right, then, by the way, I have this pet peeve about unused masks, so this isn't necessary, but unless I need a mask, I'm just going to right click and delete it. Anyways, I'm gonna call this layer hard mix and I'm gonna set the blending mode to hard mix. If you haven't already heard me talk about a hard mix a million times, I'll link to a video that gets into a little bit more detail, but the important part is that as long as this solid is somewhere between red and yellow, the hard mix blending mode is gonna limit the image to just black, white, red, and yellow. Okay, then I'm gonna follow up this hard mix layer with an adjustment layer, a black and white adjustment layer, and that's gonna assign gray values to the yellow and the red. So I'm gonna change the reds to be 33% gray and the yellows to be 66, just so they're a little bit more evenly spaced out. So the nice thing about this setup is that by changing the color of this hard mix layer, we have all kinds of control over the balance between these four values. It's pretty intuitive shifting this around, but obviously we can change kind of the overall brightness, but then the more saturation there is, the more of the mid-tones we get. If we introduce more red, it's gonna shift the balance toward that darker gray. Moving toward yellow is gonna bring out more of the lighter gray. So for now, I'm just gonna kind of eyeball this and we will move on to part two. And here, I'm gonna go back to the image layer and give it some treatment, some filters and things. But it's nice to do this once these layers are set up so that I can treat the image in a way that works well under these kind of minimal conditions. So there's not necessarily a one size fits all treatment for images, but I'm gonna walk through kind of a cocktail of adjustments and filters that generally do a pretty good job. First of all, I'm almost always gonna use the shadows and highlights adjustment to bring out lots of detail in the shadows and kind of flatten out the image. I'm not using the highlights option at all, but I've got shadows cranked all the way up to 100. All right, after that, even though I like some of the grunginess that's kind of built into this image, I'd rather clean it up as much as I can and then introduce any noise or grunge as a more controlled, deliberate effect. So I'm gonna use camera raw filter to clean up the image and I'm not messing with any of the color or exposure settings. I'm just going into the detail section and using the noise reduction settings. I've got noise reduction here all the way up at 100 and then kind of just pushing around the detail and even some of these sharpening options to try to get rid of all the noise and grunge but leave as much of the sharp detail as I can. Okay, next up is Unsharp Mask. And when Unsharp Mask is purposely cranked up really high, it can give you all these little outlines and sharp details that create almost more of an illustrated look. Next, we're gonna reintroduce some of that noise and grain. First, by adding some noise, I'm gonna use Uniform Noise at about 15% and set to Monochromatic. I'm gonna follow that with Gaussian Blur with the radius at just one pixel. And that's gonna take that sharp detailed noise and turn it into more of a large chunky grain. And finally, I'm gonna double down on the shadows and highlights adjustment. I'm gonna use that again to flatten out the image even a little bit more. Sometimes this additional shadows and highlights can be a little bit too much, but on this image, I think it's working pretty well. 
Okay, we're ready for part three, and here we're gonna colorize the image, replacing these gray values with colors. So I'm gonna leave the black as black, but let's replace this darker gray value. What I'm gonna do is create a new solid, and for now, I'm thinking about skin tone, so I'm gonna go with kind of a dark red. Then to make this red basically replace that dark gray, I'm gonna double click the layer and in the blend if slider, the very bottom one for underlying layer, I'm gonna drag the blacks up and the whites down and find that very, very narrow spot in the spectrum where the dark gray is. Remember that darker gray is 33% gray, so it makes sense that it would be right around here. So now whatever this solid color is, it's basically gonna replace that darker shadow color. All right, then let's create another color to replace the lighter gray. Again, I'm thinking about skin tones, so I'm gonna do a lighter orange color, then I'm gonna double click for the blending options and target the lighter gray, which was 66% gray, so that's gonna be somewhere right around here, and I will call this layer Midtones Color One. Then I'm gonna create a solid that will replace those bright whites, so kind of a light peach sort of color. And since this is replacing the whites, the blend if slider is gonna be all the way up here at the top. So now I've got these three colors and I'm gonna push them around a little bit in relationship to one another, but I'm still not too worried about the exact colors. It's a little hard to get a sense of when you're only looking at these three colors and there's nothing for them to be in relationship to. So let's introduce some more colors. First of all, I wanna create an alternate shadow color. Maybe in some of these areas, I don't want the shadows to be red. I want them to be more of a blue. So what I'll do is right over this shadows color, create another solid, sort of a bluish color. And it doesn't need any kind of special blend if settings or anything. All I need to do is alt or option click between these layers to create a clipping mask. So this blue is now sitting on top of the red and basically filling it in with blue instead. Now, I actually do wanna keep the mask on this blue layer because I can use this mask to decide where I want the blue shadows and where I want the red shadows. Here's an important note though. If I use the paintbrush tool in this mask, even at its hardest setting, a paintbrush still has these slightly anti-aliased smoothed edges. And that creates just a little bit of a soft transition between the colors. And I don't want that. I want absolutely crunchy, pure colors. So instead of the paintbrush tool in the mask, I'm gonna use the pencil tool. It's basically the same as the paintbrush, but it has no anti aliasing. It's nice and sharp, all or nothing. And this way, I'm only introducing one color. No soft edges, no purplish in between colors. So what I'm going to do is fill this mask with black, and then I'll just go through the image and use this mask to determine where I want this alternate shadow color to be. Then we'll do the same thing for the midtones, introduce a secondary midtones color. So this should probably be a yellowish color that I can use for the blonde hair. I'll use a clipping mask to put this on top of the midtones color. And then I'm gonna fill this mask with black and then just use the pencil tool to decide where I just want these yellow midtones. Finally, an alternate highlight color, a pure white. So this is gonna sit on top of the highlights color solid. And then I'll use the pencil tool to decide where I want these white highlights. Okay, so we've now got two shadow colors, two midtones, and two highlights. And there's nothing wrong with going back in and adjusting these colors as you go. Maybe you've got a reference image of an old screen print that you can pull samples from, or you can just eyeball it like I'm doing here. In any case, that's the overall structure of this setup. And that brings us to part four, where I can continue to add elements underneath all these adjustments and colors. So first, I'm gonna add a gradient at the bottom here to create kind of a fade out. I'll just set this layer to multiply. And then maybe we can create a big blurry glowing version of Randy. And uh, I'm gonna give this some noise and a little bit of blur to give it kind of a greeny look. I'll add some typography in here. And it's really just a matter of getting into these masks and painting or filling in with a pencil where and which one of these colors you wanna to apply to each element. I'm gonna drop some stars in the background and give these kind of a soft mask around the edges. I can get back into that highlights mask and make some of these stars pop out as white. And then after pushing things around, and I think I've established that these are my six colors, we can go to another step where we start to move these colors around. And what I mean is we've got our six colors and they're kind of paired with the shadows and the midtones and the highlights, but there's no reason why I can't decide, well, maybe I want to reuse this blue in some of the highlights. So by duplicating this blue solid and applying it in the highlights, I can make some of these bright stars blue. And I can copy this red into the highlights and make some of the stars red. Additionally, everything we've done so far has been underneath these colors and hard mix layers, 
But of course, we can put things on top of these layers. We just have to make sure they're restricted to this color palette. So this lightning bolt is going to sit on top, but I'm using a little bit of noise and blur and then adding a threshold to make sure it's just pure white. Since white is one of our colors, we're still good. All right, finally, let's take this design and create a mock-up. I'm gonna copy this over to a t-shirt blank. And the way I'm gonna copy this is by using select color range. I'm gonna set it to select shadows with the fuzziness and the range at zero, and then selecting invert. So that's gonna select every pixel that is not black. Then I'm gonna use command shift C to make a merged copy. Paste this onto a t-shirt blank, and this would probably make a whole separate video in and of itself, but we'll do kind of the rapid fire version. I'm gonna use a little bit of blend if to let through some of the blacks in the background. And then I wanna use a mask for some grungy texture here, but if you'll indulge me for a second, I really almost never use masks for this, and I feel like I should do this the way I actually do this, which is dragging in a high resolution texture, then using blend if to knock out the blacks on that texture then putting it in a folder and setting the folder to zero fill and knockout shallow. What's the point of that? Well, it means we can use this texture as a mask, but we get to keep it as a live smart object and avoid baking it into a mask where you get one shot to place it and get the contrast or the scale just right. You can also try out different mask textures by putting them in this folder. In any case, that's it. Our 80s rock t-shirt is done. We can always dial in this final image with camera raw filter or some adjustment layers. You can grab any of the textures I've used in this video or this t-shirt blank. Those are free on the Texture Lab site, which I will link to below. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.